squares fielder. He's gone to the dogs. We were hunting on this reservoir. You're snatching you're not allowed in there. And they have a watchman <laughs> that comes every once in a while at night. Well, there's, here they had the gate as usual locked. And there was a truck in the driveway before the uh, uh, right at the gate there. And there was somebody in there. I thought, what could they be doing? They don't have no dog box or anything. So I walk up to it. And here there's a girl in there. And she jumps. And I startled her quite a bit. And I seen her reach for something, but I didn't know what. I, I thought... Maybe it's lovers or whatever. I don't know. But uh, I backed off here and went backwards. My buddy was in the truck. I said, I don't know who's in there. But I said, I don't think it's a hunter. And just then I see a red light coming from the other side, the gate toward that truck where I seen the woman in. And he hollered out. He was about 50 yards from me. Can I help you? I says, yeah, I'm lost. A couple of dogs are on the other side of this gate. Probably got a coon tree down over the hill or something. And he came up to me and talked. He was quite cordial. He's probably in his 20s, 25. And I later found out that was his wife. I figured, boy, that's a real party. Take your wife out coyote hunting. That's what he was doing. And uh, so we got to talking. He says, I know you from somewhere. I said, you look familiar too. I says, he said to me, uh, do you, you do this a lot? And I said, darn near every night. He said, did I meet you at Jack Bell's place one time? That's a farmer that don't allow anybody hunt. He allows me to coon hunt as long as I don't come during deer season. I said, that's where. I said, you was out in the field at Jack Bell's. And I was afraid that my dogs was going to into you calling and you'd love to shoot one of my dogs. So I purposely shined my light on you so you knew somebody was there with them dog. And I walked down closer and got to you and we got to talking. I says, uh, he has permission there also. And so I got a hold of my dogs and got out of there and leave the place to himself. So I didn't want the dogs going back there and getting a some shot in him or something. He had a good outfit, all kind of them uh, uh, things. Uh, recorders and, and stuff. No, no, oh, he had the recorders, but he had them things that uh, pick up uh, thermal waves and that. Oh, and yeah. you could tell if there's an animal somewhere near you. It was pretty slick. But anyhow, I says, uh, are you going to stay here or what? He says, now I'll probably go another place. I said, what's the chance of you leaving that ga gate unlocked? <laughs> and I'll put the lock on like it's dummy locked. I said, because there's a couple of dummies going in. And I said, we'll lock it the right way when we leave. He said, yeah, I don't see no problem. Well, we went in there and the dogs were struck, but they were already 900 yards from us. So we drove as far as we could. We're still 600 yards from them. We could hear them, but uh, not good from where we were. And both these dogs got good mouths, one especially. So I says to my buddy, uh, Herman, I said, let's drive around the block and see if we hear them dogs better. Well, we got down there and we got a little closer with the Garmin and picking them up. And there's an old bunch of trucks parked way back in the woods that used to be uh, um, the guy actually uh, picked up uh, the manure and dumped it on the fields there. Well, we still couldn't hear the dogs worth a darn, but we decided to get out of the truck and walk back there. As soon as we got out of the truck, it went down to 350 yards. So we kept on walking. Then all at once, there was a big drop-off going down into a bottom. Some people would call it a canyon, but it's just a deep valley. We got down there and we found an old road. You couldn't drive a vehicle down there, but we walked and it took us right to the dogs. They were treated on a den tree. And this tree was big enough to put your truck in. I mean, it was enormous. There's holes all over there. 
So we got a hold of the dogs and got out of there and walked back to the truck and drove back to the uh, where uh, we originally started, where we got to lock that gate and go somewhere else. We locked the gate, and I tried to back out that driveway to the hard road, and I wasn't paying attention. I was looking in the mirrors instead of turning my head every once in a while. They had guide rocks going into that driveway, and they were covered with snow. It was about six inches of snow. I never seen them coming in, and I've seen them a hundred times in the daytime when I went by. I backed right up over a big rock. I mean a big one. And I heard the scraping of the frame and everything else. We got out and looked, see how much damage we did. I, we looked and we figured if we go frontwards or backwards, we're going to pay some money because, well, we're going to tear all the exhausts out or tear part of the frame out. And we try, I have a handyman jack. Any coon hunter, if they don't have one of them, they never coon hunt it. It gets you out about anything. You can lift a truck. You could turn it over if you want. Well, this one wasn't working too good. I couldn't get it up high enough to avoid that rock. And you couldn't move that rock no how. Uh, it was probably a half a ton anyhow. And I started going back and forth rocking it. I made a little headway, and I thought, well, I'm going to just end up paying to get truck repaired again. So I finally got it going a little bit better, and I floored it. I, I thought, sure as heck, I did some damage and bad damage. But I didn't do nothing. Just scraped a little bit of the frame in that. So we got out of there, and we quit after that. But that's going out now. That ain't nothing unusual for me. The very next night, me and a, a girl went, uh, Patty Visit. She's got uh, blue dogs and black and tans, and they're pretty good dogs. And uh, she'll go every night if you call her. And uh, she usually calls me. But uh, we went to a place that we've hunted a lot of times. It's usually pretty safe, and it's got a fair amount of coon. The first coon they run, the only thing is a couple too many roads in there. The only thing is, we run a coon in there. They tried a tree a couple times and never could settle. And too many cars was coming through. That's the trouble with the places I on. And uh, so we just decided to grab him, go to a safer place. <coughs> we Fred, went to another. Let me interrupt you right there. Yeah, sure. I want my listeners to know who this guy is that's telling us these coon hunting stories like he actually knows what he's talking about. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the audience, but I don't think you need any introduction because most of the people that are listening to this podcast have heard of you. Uh, Fred Moran, the Red Bone Man. Fred, it's a real privilege to have you on the podcast today, and I know we're going to get a lot of great stories for, from you, and I want to pick this one up that you're talking about here in just a second, but I want to get just a little bit of background before we go farther. First of all, Fred, uh, how old are you now? I'll be 85 February 16th. I still could not never less than five nights a week. You'll and be I 85. Don't, I, I don't go long. I mean, I'll treat a couple coon come home unless there's someone there to try and impress. But <laughs> I, I, was hunt, I was hunting the same woods we're going to next. I was hunting in there about a week ago, and it warmed up that day. They, they run a coon dinner good job on and they treed and i thought i could get to the dogs driving through a field you're, you're not supposed to be in that field but other guys sneak in there too and i got permission <laughs> from the woman whose property adjoins it but i hadn't been in there for oh, a good 10 years so i just decided to try because i know there's coon there well that night <clears throat> I there's a, a road goes up to one of them tires so it has a red light on so airplanes don't crash into the radio tire next to it. Well, I seen tire tracks made that night. I thought, who the heck 
in the backyard. I figured somebody heard my dog's tree in the back here, and they went back to see if I needed help or something. Well, I started sliding, going up the hill. There's snow all over the ground. And it was muddy underneath. And uh, I started sliding sideways. And I thought, oh, man, what am I going to do now? I know I'm going to have to call a couple buddies to tow me out of here. I just figured that this is all that was left. I ain't going to get out of here without getting stuck. Well, the, I floored the truck, thought I could make a grip on the upper road, and by darn, the truck did make a grip. I fooled myself. I went up the, the road backwards and got to the hard road. I knew I was safe then. And I never did see who made them other tracks, I found out later. So I knew there was another road to go back here. I figured I'd see if I could find that road. I drove up the hard road. Uh, it's called Lake Spur Road. And I get up there, and I see a house way back in the woods. I says, he ought to be able to tell me how to get there, because he's where the direction the dogs are, but he's probably a half a mile away. I go up there, and it's a log cabin house, a nice place. I knock on the door, and a kid about 12 years old comes to, and I told him, is your parents home? And I wanted to talk. Well, the old man came out on the porch. I said, hey, buddy, how about coming here to the end of the porch? I want to show you something. I says, do you hear that noise and dogs barking? He says, yeah, they've been barking for 45 minutes. <laughs> I says, they got a coon up a tree over there. And I know there used to be a road goes over there. How do I find that road? Well, he says, just wait a minute. I, I'm going to show you something. I figured he's going to get a gun, but he seemed okay. <laughs> He'd come out <clears throat> with a hunt jacket on and everything. He said, that's what they were doing at Trina Kuna. He said, I thought that's what they were doing, but I only went coon out in my life once or twice. And he says, this will be the third. He opened his garage door and got his uh, side-by-side out. He says, load up, man. We're going to go get them dog. I says, this is living. <laughs> and uh, we, we had a, through his backyard into the field, the same field I was trying to come up from a different direction, and we drove within 20 yards of the dog. I said, that's the way to go. You bet. Well, <laughs> here was the biggest tree in the woods. I guarantee you, you could put a truck in it and not find it if there's leaves on it. Uh, but it was enormous, and it had two big holes in it. I was hoping there'd be a coon on the outside because I was going to let the kid shoot it. He told me he caught one in a trap two weeks before it would 23 pounds. <laughs> and even up here, that's a big coon. And uh, so we didn't get that coon. I treed one earlier before I went over to that farm. And uh, Well, let's it, talk it, about just a minute. I'm, you've got so many stories. And I want to hear them all, and I know our listeners want to hear them yeah, all, too. Yeah, you're going to hear but half them. I want to jump in here just a minute, and yeah. let's go back and tell what we call the backstory or the background. Who is Fred Moran? Where is, did he come from? Uh, what did he do for a living? Uh, how did he get involved? What's his favorite breed of dogs? I know the answer to that one. Yeah. But uh, everybody. <laughs> all right, but just just tell me here, uh, Fred. Uh, I, I, let's go I, I, all the way back to the beginning. Well, the beginning was my parents owned a bar and restaurant in Duquesne. Naturally, guys come in for a beer and a sandwich and stuff like that, and some of them were hunters, mostly small game and deer hunters. Very few coon hunters. But there was two guys who were coon hunters. And they didn't go at it like I did. But they, they'd go a fair amount. And they kept telling me they are going to take me coon hunting. I was about eight years old then. And uh, they kept promising me. But something always came up. They never showed up. Or I'd be sitting there waiting since 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So 7.30 gets around. But one day... I went to the movies. You know, I used to go every Saturday. Cost 14 cents to get in. And a penny pretzel next door to Elsie's. 
And I, I went, they told me they'd be there at uh, 6.30 or something, I forget. I was in the movie theater watching Roy Rogers, and all at once somebody, you can't find anybody in the movie theater, but somebody hollered out real loud, Fred Moran. I thought, what did I do now? And here got, I get up to see who called me, and I recognize a guy that drank at my dad's bar. He says, John and them are waiting for you. You're supposed to go coonut. I said, they had done this a hundred times, left me wait there, and they never showed up. He says, they're up there waiting on you at the bar. So we drive up the road to where the tavern was and so forth, and they had the dogs in the truck and ready. They had two red dogs at the time. That ain't what made me fall in love with red dogs, but that's what they happen to have. So I got my clothes on, that my flashlight, and uh, we went hunting. Well, we didn't get no coon that night, but the dogs treat a possum. Oh, that was as good as finding a gold mine to me. I, I want a coon, possum, I didn't care. Just so something was in that tree. They got a possum, but they didn't bother or anything like that. They just left it alone. Uh, I I wish they would have, but I wanted to see a dog fight a coon or something like that. But the next time they took me, we got a coon. So I was hooked forever then. That's all I wanted to do. My parents wouldn't let me go during weekdays. They said, you got school in the morning. But, uh, oh, I loved it. And I'd go anytime I, I could. And I met some other guys through them. And... Their name was John Champ, and he was formerly from West Virginia, and his Good partner man. was Otis Timms. And, uh, well, Nashie, they're gone now. But uh, I, I hunted with them off and off probably for two, three years, and then I started hunting with some other guys. They didn't go enough for me. They'd just go like a Friday or Saturday night, maybe once during the week. But they had some good dogs. They weren't bad. They were great dogs, which means no papers. But uh, uh, they were as good looking as any registered dog that I've seen even to this day. But they were just great dogs. Right. And uh, I kept wanting to get a dog myself, want my own dog. And I was only nine years old then. And one guy that come in the bar, he he didn't coon hunt, but he's gone with people like I did. And he's telling me wh where you get dogs and everything else. And there's a guy um, with what most people would call a dog trader. He had dogs for sale, trade, and everything else. I I used to walk 10 miles to his house just to look at the dogs all the time. He had me hooked. Uh, I never bought nothing from him. Yeah, I did get one. I got I had a beagle that somebody gave me, and it wasn't bad. And he got a little better because I hunted him darn near every night or every day. And uh, he offered to take the beagle in on his coon dog. Well, I should have known right away uh, when they offered a swap even up. He ain't getting much. So, <laughs> but anyhow, <clears throat> the the blue dog that I got off him, wasn't half as good as a beagle I give him. And uh, he was a complete flop. I give him to a, a buddy that went hunting with me occasionally. He says, he told me, he was about three years older than me. He told me the dog just up and run off and he never seen him again. I To this day, I think he shot him. But that's the yeah. way he goes. Yeah. Uh, but getting back to uh, uh, the coon hunting part, I had to have my own dog, my own dog. And I went to a night hunt with some guys one time. And I went three or four times with them. I didn't have a dog. But uh, a guy by the name of Henry Hofstetter, he was from um, Ohio, uh, can't be. I'll think of the town. It's over in the eastern part of Ohio. He went, uh, was, I went in his cast one night and, uh, he said, you like to hunt, don't you? I said, yep. And, uh, he said, how about I give you a dog and I'll pay you some money 
and you take them hunting as much as you could. Oh, man, I thought I died and went to heaven. So he gave me a red dog. He was about 10, 11 months old at the time. Now, I had dogs before that in between. That blue dog, like I say, uh, I give it to my buddy Pete, and I, I, he says to run away, but I think he did, did it in. But anyhow, this red dog, he ran the first night in the woods with another dog and treated a little bit. I thought, man, there's some a prospect here. I kept hunting him, kept hunting him. And I had the dog tree and coon probably within uh, 10 times out, an easy coon he could tree. And I called the guy. I says, Henry, what would you sell that dog for? He says, 100 and a half. I thought that was a little high for especially a kid. And, uh, I thought he'd give me a break. And my mother and parents, none of my relatives hunted. I was the only one interested in hunting. My, my dad wouldn't go across the street for Merchant's Bali uh, <laughs> if somebody offered it to him. Uh, and he, uh, anyhow, uh, I couldn't afford a hundred and a half. But I, through savings and everything, I had a hundred dollars. I had my mother get on the phone with him. She at least would uh, baby me on my hunting and that my dad could care less. And uh, I says, give me, give me $25. I'll, I'll pay you back. No, I ain't wasting $25 on a dog. I kept that up for maybe two weeks. Finally, she let in, give me $25. Then I didn't know if I was going to get him for honor and a quarter, but I did. And that was my magic dog. He's the one that made me famous, as far as I'm concerned. Well, let, me, so let me jump yeah. right in right there, yeah. because there's going to be several of these dogs that I want to ask you about. But at that, at maybe we're being premature here, but coon hunters across the country, and, and maybe because of your advertisements, Fred, but they know you as Fred Moran, the Red Bone Man. Where I'll tell did you how that, that start? came about? Yes. Uh, I used to go to so many night hunts. Everybody 16 years old, 16 years old was dating a girl. So not me. I was coon hunting on Saturday nights and every night before, too, usually. And there was two guys who used to sell dog supplies at the night hunts. And uh, they were at every night hunt. They are nice guys. They had a walker dog named Tarleton's Balling Bowser. It was, uh, um, what the heck was I, their first names. Uh, one, they just called him Tat. Uh, his right name was Bob. Harry was the other one. Harry was a sane one of the three. And the other two, I think they had a <laughs> bolt loose. But anyhow. When I'd pull up in my truck and say, Fred Moran, the Red Bone Man, those are the guys that give me that name. I didn't give it to me or nobody else, they did it. And it caught on. Every hunt I'd go to, the Red Bone Man. And that's how I got that nickname. But uh, I remember I, I hunted with Brooks McGill in 1959, who was the most famous Red Bone Man probably even to this day. And they used to just say, the red bone man, the red bone man, when, uh, when you accompanied him anywhere. And by the way, I was lucky enough to go down and hunt with him in 1959. It was so cold for being in Mississippi. Three of us slept in a bed together, and we were still shivering. <laughs> well, let me I jump in a, here. I shot a quail that night, roosted on a tree. It was probably a hundred percent luck, although I always thought I was pretty good. I knocked his head right off, and yeah. Brooks says that's the greatest shot I ever saw. And my buddy, other buddy, says he does that all the time. <laughs> I couldn't probably do that in ten more years. But, I'm going to uh, jump in right here now. In the course of this, uh, so far we've been at this a little about oh, twenty five minutes or so. I've got you on three uh, three counts, two counts of trespassing. Yeah. 
<laughs> one count of shooting uh, game birds. Well, and, yeah. <laughs> I, I, or, I'm uh, but I, I think the statute of limitations may be out on these things, Fred, but that's hilarious. I want to uh, just mention right here to our listeners, Brooks McGill uh, had a famous red bone dog named Jungle, Jungle Jim. Jim. Yes, sir. And Brooks was one of the people that participated in the early days of the writing of the, uh, the uh, night hunt rules, along with Robert Graves, who was another red bone man, I believe. Uh, yeah. Uh, there in Alexander City, Alabama. But anyway, just to give a little point of reference there of of uh, who you're speaking about. And this is back in the very foundation of the 1959. He said, damn time I'm talking about. Now he was around way before that and yes. a little bit after, but 1959, I was down there hunting with another famous guy named, uh, uh, uh I'll take his name. He's a blue tick man. T.C. Jones. Yes, sir. I, I always thought, I always thought I shouldn't be this way, but I am. That I, once I started going, and I had the best dogs around, and I, I could take care of any dog around as far as beating them in the night. Uh, or they knew more than I did, or I knew more than they did, rather. But that's one man that I always thought could teach you something. T.C. Jones, that guy knew more about dogs than most people would ever learn. Uh, I always look up to him as my hero as far as handling dogs and selling dogs and stuff like that. Well, uh, in our he, conversations at our hunting camp each year in uh, uh, Arkansas, uh, a couple of the fellows that are there are from Mississippi, and I know Morris Hardy for one. Uh, mentioned uh, T.C. Jones, and I think my buddy Nubbin Moore uh, has also mentioned him. And I, I remember think his this, I ads. think this Hardy was one of the camps that we were in one time. He may have been. Morris that was been at at Holy, Holy Bluff, Mississippi. I see. Yeah. Where we got. Right. T.C. used to rent an old shack, and it gets somebody in the area to be the camp cook, clean up after us, all we did was hunt. And I'll tell you a real story. This will be a fact. Well, one day we were out squirrel hunting, and we had a bad day, which doesn't happen much down there for squirrel hunting, and T.C. had some good dogs. and uh, But we had a bad day. Well, here I was down there, a friend of mine I invited to go along, Chuck Bailey. He's passed now, and uh, he... He uh, went down there with me and another guy, Jack Cottrell. He's going now, too. And they had blue dogs and me, and that's he was a red dog. Well, we're out there with a little curve that T.C. had, and he was good. Uh, they called him Spotty. We killed 57 squirrel with him in four afternoons, and we did not long. Well, we were having a bad day. And Chuck says, uh, or Jack Cottrell, he says, throw, throw your ad up, see if I can hit it. Well, uh, Chuck said that. I had an old junk hat, probably cost two bucks. I, th I threw it up, and uh, whether he hit it or not, I really don't remember. I don't think he did, but he just shot at it one time. He, I said, throw your hat up. He used to buy them. Bailey cowboy hats. They cost at that time. Uh, this is quite 50 years ago. At that time, they cost uh, 16 dollars and up. He threw it up, and he thought, or I threw it up, and or one of the guys did, and he thought I was going to shoot at it one time. I had an automatic rifle. I emptied that gun while I was in the air, and when it landed on the ground, I still kept shooting till I ran out of bullets. He says. The other guys all were, they're nuts. They're nuts. And, <laughs> and I started running up the road because I knew Chuck was going to chase me. And we, <laughs> we come back We come back to the camp. And the general we had cooking for us, his name was Arthur. A real nice guy. You couldn't ask for a better guy. Quiet, never said nothing. We had a, uh, he come into camp and he says, Arthur. 
look what happened. I was going to go up the road and see if it was better squirrel hunting, and someone opened fire on me. Look at my hat. And old Arthur, serious as could be, he seen all them holes in that hat. Uh, that hat. He said, Mr. Chuck, I sure would get the law after that man. Oh, he was a character <laughs> in the house. But, uh, he, well, listen, you mentioned there T.C. Jones, and, of course, that's a great yeah. name in Coonhound history. Yeah. What Back in the early days when you started going to the hunts, you were talking about your first dog was a dog named Magic. Yep. Tell us about Magic. Well, Magic, he a uh, medium-sized red dog, probably about 60 pounds, somewhere in there. Not uh, decent looking dog, no, no, no show dog or anything like that. Don't get me wrong, I like a good looking dog too, but I've had better looking dogs than him. But he was a tree dog. And I, being you lived in Michigan, I know you know this guy or heard of him, Paul Scott. Yes, you ever remember him? I, re I remember the name, yes. Mm -hmm. He had a dog named Scout, a walker dog, and I don't remember what kind of hunt came down to, but it was where the cast goes down to uh, just four dogs, you know, for the final cast. Mm -hmm. Well, there was only two. I guess it wasn't a big crowd. I don't remember. There was only two people, and one was me, and the other one was Paul uh, or Scott, I think was his name. And But he real a real nice guy. Harry uh, Tarleton agreed to judge the final cast because not too many people were around at, at 2 in the morning. We went out, I think we treated six coons. We had a good hunt, and not because I got lucky and won it. He had every strike and I had every tree, which is more important to me than the striking, but I'm not sticking up for my own dog. But it was a heck of a good hunt, no argument. Everything just like clockwork. Uh, he got uh, all them strikes, and I got all them trees, and we seen every coon. Another guy that, well, I think of it, that I met, I don't know if you know this one. I know you know them all, but uh, <laughs> oh, Estel Nash. Estel Nash. Ever hear him? Uh, you know, these names uh, do he resonate walker, with he me. He was a walker man from Indiana. Okay. And he used to go to a lot of hunts. He was in his second childhood. He used to like fancy trucks. Every time he'd come to hunt, he'd say, let me show you what I put on my truck this time. Him and I became good friends. Well, Sounds like out. another Redbone guy that I used to hunt with up there a little bit, Jerry Batchelder. Did you ever meet Jerry? I knew Jerry. Yeah. I, I never hunted with him, but I knew him well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, go he, ahead. Yeah. Well, anyhow, um, uh, he had a walker dog. He's called, uh, I'll think his name. Uh, I got his picture at, uh, at put away in storage. Uh, the dog, he was a night champion. They don't even allow you to show a blind dog now, but at that time you could show a blind dog. He was blind. He's the first walker dog. I bet most of the walker men don't know this that made four-way night champion and bench champion. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe that he was blind. When I nobody was looking, I got him on the side. I made all my tests, and he convinced me he was blind. That dog was a heck of a dog. I mean, he was a heck of a dog. And uh, there was another walker man at that time that was quite famous, and I told him about it. I said, that's got to be the best dog I ever seen. He's stone blind. He's beating us. He's, you know, he bad mouth him a little bit. He's one of these that if he ain't winning, it's, but there's, there's that in all sports, I feel. But, uh, but I think hound men are the most jealous there is. That's always been my belief, whether it's beagles or coon dogs or whatever. There was a guy in uh, back home where I used to live. He was quite famous for having beagles win all the beagle trout. And I seen him at the feed store one day, and I said to him, Albert, tell me the truth. 
as jealousy as much in Beagles as it is in Coon Dog, he laughed a little bit and he said, you better believe it. So, Why do you think that is, Fred? And everybody I'm... wants to say they own the best. You can't beat me. And sometimes it's true, but not too often. They could all be beat. And you get that given night, you know. Right. But, well, I've always thought that when a guy puts a nameplate on a dog's collar, then um, subconsciously that dog becomes an extension of that guy. Yeah. You know, this way, is my dog, and th- he's representing me, and I'm I'm perfect, and therefore he's going to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. It don't work out that way all quite. the time. But there's, there's a lot of it. And then you meet a couple guys that, oh, that, that gives you their right arm to go with you on that. But there's, there's a yeah. lot of jealousy. But uh, Esther was a good old guy. I, I trained a pup for him. First day, he took it right to a night hunt, won second place. It was Walker Day. And uh, I can't think of the father of that dog's name. Well, oh, let's go and, back to Magic a minute now. So you had Magic. Was uh, About how old were you at the time you had Magic? You I'd, I'd say uh, probably 14 or 13. Really? And Yeah, I had him. He he ended up dying at my place. He I think he was eleven when he died, and uh, uh, he's well now. She slowed down that, but he'd still try and he'd do a pretty good job most of the time. I had two pups out of him. One was pretty good. Uh, the other was don't get me wrong. They both were good, but one was definitely way better. And as usual, something always happens to the good ones. The garbage ones live forever, but a car got that. And, and my buddy had a, a pretty good one out of it that hunted with me a good bet. Uh, but I don't know why, when it got older, uh, he had it till about six years old. It started getting growing, and it was a female, it wasn't a male. And mm-hmm. I don't know, he ne- she never got in a fight or anything, but uh, she did enough noise that yeah, I expected it any night. but. Uh, never did it while I was there. I'd seen her growl a lot, though. Well, and... here, here's a point, um, Fred. Um, you know, back in the early days of the night hunts, and this is before, you know, James Merchant bo- yeah. won uh, the world hunt three times with Bali and so forth. The red bones were very prominent in any kind of competitions right. and so forth. Uh, the field trials, uh, there were very prominent red bone dogs that would just sweep those early day field trials before oh, yeah. the night hunts. But then also the very first UKC night champion was, one was, by red bone. was a red bone. Yes. Yep. So the red bones, I'm, what, where I'm going here is that maybe back in that day, it was a little easier, do you think, to find yeah, a good red yeah, dog to breed de- to? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I say, uh, uh, it got to, to my way of thinking, you start seeing less and less showing up at the night on. But uh, the ones that were winning, they, kept, they used to have a dog in Ohio that, I happened to beat Shetler Sonny Boy, which was quite a dog and you know, the talk of the town most of the time. And when he got beat by a red dog, that was highly unusual. I can't remember the guy's name, but he was from near Columbus, Ohio. And the mm-hmm. dog's name was uh, Buckeye Red. And uh, Car- Carl was the guy's first name. I do mm-hmm. remember that. And I know two guys have offered a good price for him. It's almost as much as they get right now for a pop dog. Wow. And that was highly yeah. unusual at that time. Well, so, at what point did you start advertising in the magazines? Magic. Was, magic. You started yeah. with I, magic. Yeah, huh? because I thought, I got a dog as good as that dog, and it's winning all kind of hunts. And I made him night champion in no time and grand night. And uh, uh, he... He did a lot of winning. Then first time they had that uh, uh, autumn, uh, not autumn, but uh, uh, the leafy oak. No, it's 
where you got recognition for the breeder of the year or something, uh, the best male dog uh, uh, sire for dogs. They still have that to this day. Uh, I got two dogs in it, Magic and Hickory. Uh, Hickory uh, was out of Magic. That was probably, he definitely in the top three dogs I ever had. And pretty close, probably number one in a red dog. Uh, I I remember the night hunt. He had such a good mouth. I got a dog like him now that I'm real proud of. Uh, Magic, I, I'd be in a night hunt. Magic, had, or uh, Hickory, a tree, maybe a half a mile away. And the guys in the cast says, hey, let's move up further. I want to see if our dogs are there. He just drowned them out when he hit a tree. And I loved that. I keep them oh, as far absolutely. away. As, I think we all do. <laughs> uh, as far away as possible, and they just only hear one dog. I remember another guy from Ohio. He said, "What the heck am I doing here?" <laughs> that made me proud. But, uh, uh, well, but, there's a lot of pride that's involved in, and, uh, in the having gold a good dog. Hand. He didn't have no mouth, but he was a coon dog. He He'd take tracks other dogs couldn't bark on and tree him and it'd be a coon there. I never forgot this. I was in a PKC hunt one time and it was it wasn't dark when we turned loose. Just about, but it wasn't dark. Gold hit a track in the creek and he was running up the creek and back and no other dog even barked yet. And I hunted with one of the dogs in the castle and I knew him to be a good dog. And I heard the one guy whisper to the other, if that dog, he finally treed, and there she ain't treed yet. He said, if that dog got a coon, we might as well quit now. We ain't got a chance. Well, fi- finally go, go did tree. I let him tree for at least a minute before I called him treed, and then he treed probably for two more minutes before another dog got on the tree. We go down there, and there's a coon. I loved it. I <laughs> loved it. Now, this dog's name was Midnight Gold? Was that? The, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I I placed him in ACHA World Hunt uh, when it, they were a world hunt, you know, five, six hundred dogs, not no 30, 40. But I, I placed five red dogs in the world hunt, a, a, a a C H A World Hunt. Yeah. I only I only placed one in a UKC World Hunt and I placed uh I got fifth okay, I got I got one two in uh, um A C H A three in A C H A there, uh, three mm-hmm. females and two males. Well, and, I was just uh, going to ask you, you were in these dogs that we were talking about here, they were all males, and I just wondered, do you ever no, hunt? Uh, no. you, you had, I remember a, a female or two that you had. Talk about I, them. Two years in a row, I p- placed one, I don't like this far down, but it's just still a play, ninth one year and tenth the next year. Uh, I can't even think of that one's name now. But I bought bought her. Uh, she was already a maid dog, but I bought her up in uh, Michigan. Did you uh, have one named Melody? Melody Sue. That was the best one I ever okay. had. <laughs> I won. Uh, back, if you remember, the early hunts, were, a lot of them were not UKC. or They were called uh, Eddie Ross is the one that promoted them and came up with them. They was called... Uh, uh, Mountain music hunts. Well, the, the big ones were, but uh, smaller ones were elimination hunts. You went out three times if you were lucky. That's the first one I met that Astro Nash. In. I beat him the first time, but he beat me that other one that I got the picture of. And uh, that was a good hunt. And the trouble with that, if you did good and went all the way, You'd be getting, people were going to church and you're just getting out of the woods. That's <laughs> part of the reason they eliminated and start making a, just a plain two hour and three hour hunt. But they were good hunts. I thought they were. Um, but, uh, well, you remember I, the days of the three hour hunt. 
Oh, and, I'm uh, at four iron. Four. Yeah. Uh, that that one that Eddie Ross used to put on. I'm trying to think what they called American. I, I forget. I know it right away if I heard. But uh, they were the original night hunts were four hours long, and uh, that, that took it out of you. Well, I guess I remember hunting in the three-hour hunts, and it would seem seem you'd get a lead right there and tree a coon or two and be feeling pretty good about it. But the problem was trying to hold on to that lead for that other hour and a half for two hours was was the tough part. A guy you might have heard of, he used to have a guy in the early years, but he he don't even hunt anymore, but it was Grayson Paul at Blue Tick from Pennsylvania. Him and I used to go to hunt, hunt three hours in a hunt and start home, and we'll see a big woods. That looks good. Pull over and hunt for two more hours. Uh, <laughs> that's when I had some pep in my step. Well, you sound, uh, you're sound sounding now about like Frank Giddings up in Michigan when I was up I, there a I, couple I, years. Have... I've met him, but I, 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 I know my buddies were up there one day to breed a dog, and they he was already hunting. He come in at three o'clock in oh, the morning. Yeah. So well, we said, we were hunting said, down. Hunt. He said, "Let's go hunt." Yeah. Well, we had were hunting uh, down southeast a couple of hours from where Frank lives uh, up there uh-huh. a couple of falls ago, and and we'd had a good hunt, and it was up around two o'clock in the morning, and we were heading back to the motel, and Frank said, "Well, I know where I've got, you know, I got, I'm going to drive on back home tonight," and I said, "Well, it'll take you a couple hours." Well, a little more than that, he said, "I've got uh, two or three drops that I'm going to make on the way back." <laughs> well, they tell me he's a heck of a hunter. Oh, I never yes. got to hunt with him. Yeah, well, you uh-huh. need to. You guys will get along great. I, I know you. Is he? Is he still around? He is still around. He's just past 80 now, uh, 81 maybe. Oh, he's uh, a kid. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, he is. Hey, now you got, okay, we were talking the other day, and I, I, um, we talked a little bit about your red dogs, and I know you, you've you been affiliated with the Red Bone Coonhound, both associations, I believe, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you usually go to Red Bone Days? Most of the time. I haven't gone the last two years I but i usually go uh-huh. uh i belong to na- uh, national longer than american mm-hmm. and uh the only uh, reason i joined american me and fred luber was he was at my house staying one time and we jimmy car uh carpenter called while we uh, we had a bet and me and uh whoever uh loses uh, got to pay the membership of the other associations dues. So me and Luber beat Carpenter, and he do, bought our dues for the American. Uh, uh, I, I I support them all, but uh, uh, Nationals have been my favorite because I've been in it longer. Um, my kids even, and he don't coon on anymore. He has a bobcat dog, and he just put it to sleep yesterday. The dog. 13 years old or 12, one of the two. He was a good dog. Well, you mentioned here, and I want to clarify there, I, I, I hate to interrupt you because you got so many interesting things to share, but the National Association, the National Red Bone Coon Hounds Association, is the UKC chartered group. Right, right. And they have their breed days every year on 4th of July weekend, or the closest there to it, I believe. And then the other association is the American Red Bone Coonhound Association. Right. And they have UKC events as well, but oh, yeah. uh, they don't carry the charter with UKC. Right. And That's then true. there's also That's the true. U.S. Red Bone Days. Do they still have that U.S. Yeah, day? they still have it. They When they first started having them, they had tremendous crowds. I remember them getting over 100 dogs. Mm-hmm. And that's red bones only. But slowly by surely, I don't know for what reason, they dropped in attendance. Now, they still have them, but they get probably uh, 40 dogs as a rule anymore, which ain't bad, but it ain't, you know, like it used to be. Well, you opened the door to something there just a minute ago that I just cannot let pass up. You mentioned the name of my 
longtime friend, and unfortunately he's passed on now. We kind of called him uh, on the UKC crew there. We called him the Silver Fox. Lubert. Fred Lubert. Yep. What's your favorite Fred I, Lubert? Story? I played so many tricks on him. <laughs> oh, me and Packy. Well, you knew Packy. And, yeah, let uh, me jump in there and tell people who Larry, Larry Packy was a field He's wrecker. a ton of fun. He's a ton I of fun. Yeah, he was a big guy from Pennsylvania, single guy, uh, one of the best rules guys I ever met. One of the funniest guys I ever met, and I could tell you quite a few Packy stories, but Fred, uh, you've got a lot of them. But before we get on to Mr. Packy, I want you to uh, go ahead with what you were saying, and and, and let's uh, talk a little bit about Fred Luber. Well, Fred Luber is a nice guy. I, he liked me. He liked to have a good dog and a top dog. He came to my house, on, him and his wife. We, my wife and I went out to his place. He came to our, and me and Packy, we, first thing we did, we took him, everybody in Pennsylvania and Southwest, if a fisher hunt heard of this place, Beaver Run Reservoir. There's 5,000 acres in there. Fantastic coon hunt. Of course, you ain't a lot of coon hunt there. And fantastic fishing. Every time the line hits water, you got to fish. And that's what I like. I don't like sitting there not catching them. And uh, he says, he's telling another guy came over to see me. He said, first he takes me to a place he ain't a lot of fish. I, he said, you can't fish looking over your shoulder and see if a guy's coming. And then he takes me back to the same place that night, coon hunt. He tells me he can't coon hunt here either. He says, you can be a nervous wreck and have heart trouble in no time here. Oh, we had him <laughs> going out there. He was something. And, and Larry Packy, well, I always had a name for it. Larry Lardo or, or, <laughs> uh, or pack a lot or something like that. He was a character. He loved to hunt. He'd hunt seven nights a week. Uh, he, he'd go to work when it gets dark early at 5 o'clock. He'd take his dogs and put them in a car. He never used a truck. If they had to relieve themselves, there'd be nothing to smell that. When you, and he'd go straight to the woods from work and go coon hunting and hunt maybe till 11 o'clock, then go home. He was a character. Do anything in the world for you. Uh, he was on the up and up. Uh, uh, oh, we paid, paid, played so many tricks on him. Uh, uh, it, it's in, it, I can't remember half of them, but he, if he was <laughs> your friend, uh, he'd do anything for you. And if you, if you did something cheating in a hunt net, it sure make it sure everybody knows about it. And, I remember uh, a, one of my favorite Larry Packy story was at one of the world hunts one year. And, uh, we had given a, uh, a, a an announcement that, you know, no spectators were allowed on the cast. Yeah. Uh, you could have a backup handler, but he had to be signed in at the beginning of the hunt. And if the, you had to turn the dog over to the, to the backup handler, then you couldn't switch back and just basics like that. Well, this one fellow took it upon himself to go out on a cast with a handler. Mm. And, uh, of course, it ended up uh, they uh, this guy was a guide, and I don't remember exactly what how far the the punishment went, but the deal was that he wasn't going to be able to guide anymore, and maybe not participate. I, I'm not sure. I, I can't remember that part. All I can remember is standing behind the UKC desk on one end of this row of this long table and Larry Packy sitting at the other end of the desk, hearing this guy's complaint when he got the news that he wasn't going to be able to go back out. Mm -hmm. And he, he told Larry, he said, you told us before we went to the woods that we could go along, you know, with with a cast if we wanted to. <laughs> and Packy was uh 
apt to use some pretty long words or big words. Oh, sometimes. he likes to show off. He'll say, I don't want to keep you in a diabolical situation. It's a paragorical <laughs> moment. But that ain't the way it goes. He liked to do that. He told this guy, he said, if you're saying that I told you that it was okay for you to go along on this cast, then you, sir, are an unmitigated liar. Well, the guy's face got real red, and he kind of blowed up like a big balloon and mm. come stomping down to the other end of the desk where I was standing with someone else. And he said, and he points back toward Packy, and he says, I don't know what that blankety-blank called me, but I do know I didn't like it. <laughs> he, he did what? He said, I don't know what he called me, but I didn't like it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but that was Pat, Life with Larry Packy. And to the listeners, Larry was a field representative for UKC for many years and much, much loved by everybody on the staff, yeah, everybody at UKC. He was just a terrific guy, unorthodox a little bit. You know, he, yeah, he people, marched to his own drum. No, but he, brag, no brag of people don't know this. I got him that job. Uh, Fred Miller called me. He says, they tell me that you go to a lot of hunts. How would you like to get a job with UKC and be a master hound? I said, they want to kill me now, but they, they, you'd hurry it up. <laughs> I said, but I'll tell you a guy that you should get. He's the first one at every night hunt, the last one to leave. He knows every rule, frontwards, backwards, and inside out. And he'd be a great asset to you. And I recommend to Larry yeah. Packy. Well, you did and a Miller, great thing. Miller told me, told me the right stuff that when I hired him. I said, oh, and ain't he good? He said, yep. Yeah, he says, one, of the, I, one of the best he says, ever. If, he says, if you want to know the right answer, you ask Packy. So, yeah, for that, sure, uh, for sure. Well, yeah. Fred, you are still coon hunting. At 85 years old, where where do you get your... Oh, let, let, not to interrupt you, but yeah. one, one more time. Last night, me and Patty were sitting yes. in the truck and start raining, and my phone rang. And we're listening to the dogs are up. Uh, and he went through a field into a woods. And I said, wait, I see who this is. It was Larry Tuttle. I ain't talked to him in probably mm. six, seven years. And he was an English man, and he had some good dogs. A good he coon a, hunter, yes. He hunted a lot of my red dogs, uh, A1, uh, the wild dog. Uh, heck, I had trouble getting them back. Oh, you know, let me keep them another week. And uh, they were a real nice dog. But he called me, he says, I'm looking for a little cur. He said, I don't want no dog goes two mile anymore like yours do. I want something 800 yards stops and have some brains. I says, uh, I got I got two dogs. I don't want to sell either one. I says, uh, they'll, st they'll go further than 800 yards, but they listen. I said, I blow the whistle. They'll be at my feet faster than they could run unless they're on a track. And uh, I no more a dog dragging me all over. I stopped that. I I seen how TC made him listen to that, and that put a lot into my doings. Uh, all mine listen. I blow that whistle, they come. And that's rare one don't. But uh, like I say, the one uh, that I got right now, I have to keep on him a little bit more than I like. But the guy never did any of that, and that makes a difference. you got to work with him. got to spend time with him. So, but... Uh, Coon hunting's a lot different than it used to be. And I'll tell you what, it's less and less coon hunters anymore. I don't even run into anybody anymore in the woods usually. And seven, dollars changed a lot of it. And the night hunts ain't grabbing the people like it used to. I mean, there's still people go and that, and they'll, they'll pick up this spring, but it just ain't like it was. 
At least that's my opinion. Well, of yeah. course, you lived through the golden years, as I've talked yep. about many times on this podcast, of uh, coon hunting when it was 50, 60 dogs at a UKC hunt. And, I remember uh, going to a great hunt with 96 dogs in Millerburg, Ohio. A great hunt. Wow. Of course, two, three weeks later, everybody had a set of papers. And so they <laughs> finally got to have registered dogs. So, well, the times did change, that's for sure. I get, I guess I didn't realize you were as young as you were when you started advertising dogs because well, you know, I cut my teeth on a lot, the magazine. A lot, of people, a lot of people thought they were going to come and see 50 dogs tied in the yard and a guy about 40. Well, no, I never believed in keeping more than I could hunt properly. Once in a while, a good one came by and I bought it because I do someone like it more than me. But uh, as a rule, I try to keep four dogs all the time. So, do, do you raise any puppies anymore? I haven't raised a litter of pups for 10 years. The last Let's one see. I raised, I made him uh, a grand night before he was two years old. It was a dog I called Homer. And uh, he was a nice dog. I raised him from a pup. I owned his dad, which was Rocket. Had a real mouth on him. And uh, Rocket, a woman shot him. I got eighteen hundred or eighteen thousand dollars out of her. Uh, the woman shot him. Well, well good sure for thinks. you. I, I, that's he, one of the most di uh, discouraging things that can happen I to know. a coon hunter. He yeah. treated a coon right in her yard. She could see what he's doing. And I hunted all my dogs with a light bulb on their collar because uh, got too much traffic. This way they could see the dog coming. And she shot it twice, and uh, I, I just won the state championship with it two weeks before. Wow. I said, lady, you don't realize what you did. You didn't kill just some farm dog or something. This dog's worth a lot more money than you want to pay, but I ain't going to let it ride. I says, I'll be seeing you in court. And, uh well, fortunately, my lawyer hunts with me when he, oh, he don't go but three, four times a year. And he did a good job. Yeah. And and, and then the woman, she told a lie, uh, well, a couple. But one, she says, the dog come after me. And I was running away to to the house. And I just shot up in the air and the shotgun killed it. <laughs> shot in the air and the dog died yeah. from it. It's pretty amazing over the years and all the work, uh, all the cases that I was involved in, especially in the UKC and PKC years, mm -hmm. uh, and how fantastic these stories get from these landowners. You know, and well, I, I had uh, a similar situation with dog killed you know and uh went to court the whole nine yards but that yeah guy, the stories get to be pretty uh outlandish that guy that i told you earlier in the story that that uh, got me out of the uh uh shooting his dog or him shooting my dog i heard his collar going and i thought i better get over that hill because he see them dogs eyes or something He's going to shoot him. I got over, so I put my bright light on, and he knew something was up, so he just stayed till I got down there. And I explained to him, I says, I, I didn't want you shooting my dog. I says, I figured go into your car. He said, no, I knew something was up when I seen your light. And then here I meet him 10 years later uh, when uh, two nights ago or three nights ago, I got stuck in that rock. Uh, and I thought, sure, I'd go and tear something out, but I got it out without doing any damage. I was lucky there. Yes, and, you were. Well, friend, let he, me he let, give me a card, and I got uh, his name and phone number now. Oh, that's good. That's great. You did some networking there, as we yeah. say. Well, friend, okay, we're we're looking here at. We've been at this probably a little over an hour, about uh -huh. an hour and five minutes. Okay. You're 85 years old. I'm 75. We've Not reached the A. I'm still a kid, right? And you yeah. certainly give me hope that I can have another 10 years or so well, uh, to, well, to hunt. I got one more fast for the team. I was cooning out in about 
three weeks ago, that guy that got his uh, four-wheeler out and towed me back to his garage. And uh, he said, he was at, when we was at the one tree, uh, the den tree, uh, to get the dog, he's looking at me, and I know what's going on in his mind. I knew he was going to ask it. He says, how old are you? I said, I'll be 85 in another 10 days or so. He looked at his kid. He says, don't you wish you could be like that? <laughs> uh, makes me feel good, but i tell you what, I slowed down a lot the last couple of years. Well, and you're an inspir- inspiration. I can't even say the word. I to, thought you were going to say constipation. But... <laughs> let's, let's keep it clean here now. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, seriously, Fred, you are an inspiration. Not only the guys like me who, you know, uh, I will I make it 10 more years? Who knows? Yeah. You know, we don't have the promise of tomorrow. I really. always wish I had that crystal ball tell me when. So. Well, yeah, there's that. But do you ever really think about that? What What will it be like if you have to I quit? Want, I want to, uh, like George Jones says, who's going to fill their shoes? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and I, oh, I got a good one. You'll like this one better than anything. <laughs> He's got this, a million of them, folks. No, this is the last one. <laughs> no, go Do, ahead. Did you ever hear Timmy Bruin from New Jersey? I don't think so. Well, he's bought every red dog he ever owned but one off of me. And I've known him 50, 60 years. And his boy uh, handles the dogs in the hunt all the time. Well, Anyhow, um, now I lost my train of thought what I was going to tell about. Uh, well, you uh, said, I asked you about, did you ever think about when you might have to quit? Oh, okay. He was my the greatest singer of all time. I like country music. is George Jones, in my opinion. And. I went, and they call him No-Show Jones for a reason. He don't show up half the time. But people like him so much, they forget about him. He was at a show. A kid owed me money, and he was working down that way. I said, but get me two tickets for George Jones. Me and Mary go down there. I want to see him. We went down there, and he had a good crowd, good crowd. His band, when they played 10 songs, you knew he wasn't showing up. He was drunk on the bus, and <laughs> I started a riot down there. I said, I ain't going to put up with this. He got 50 bucks of my money and ain't going to show up. The other guys picked up on it before long. They had state police there and everything. We never got a dime back, and we left there disappointed. Well, he came and played again in Pennsylvania, not far from home, about 20 miles. I said, let's go to Georgia. She said, he didn't show up last time. I said, I'll take another chance. Well, he showed up. And the promoter that I knew him, he, he got me extra good tickets right down front. I said, tell him I'm one of his greatest fans. And I seen him looking around holding a picture, but I didn't think nothing of it. That promoter called me up. That was a Saturday night. He called me up Monday. He said, hey. I was looking all over for you, so was George Jones, and we knew where you was, but we didn't see him. Come up here. I got something for you from him. Here is a picture of George Jones to my buddy Fred, and, oh, that made everything up. Well, Bruins come to my house for a hunt for three or four days, and they always came deer up and down. They seen that picture of George Jones and to my buddy Fred. And uh, how do you know him? Oh, heck, I hunt with him all the time. <laughs> and when he's up here or something, I go down to his house, him and Nancy. He couldn't believe it. Well, it just so happens. A boy that hunts with me a good bit and bought a lot of dogs, Johnny Quince from West Virginia, he can sing. He sounds just like George Jonah. I heard him before. Here he calls, and I says, hey, do a George Jones song. I'll explain later. I, I says, wait a minute. I want you to be the guy over the phone with me. I said, Jesse, 
uh, come here. This is George Jones. Ask him if you can come down and go hunt. And, ah, oh, this ain't Georgia. And, uh, boy, you want me to sing you a little song? And uh, he says, yeah. And my buddy John says, step right up. Come on. <laughs> and he could do it perfect. He sounds just like, yeah, Dad, you don't believe this. Dad, I'm talking to George Jones. <laughs> He's invite me down to go coon hunting. I figured let him go down and get arrested for trespass. So anyhow, uh, he told his dad that. He showed his dad the picture in that when his dad came. And um, he said, we'll go down there someday. I got a picture identical. I don't remember who gave it to me, but somebody gave it to me. I put it in a good frame, and I wrote on the picture, Jesse, come on down and see me. The dogs are doing good. We'll look forward to seeing you and your dad. And I, I went to a night hunt. I knew this guy would be there from Kentucky. I said, all I want you to do is mail this from a mailbox in Kentucky. He mailed it. He said, Jesse calls me up about a week later. And this guy, he said, what are you doing, Fred? What, what's, what's the deal? And I explained he says, you're rotten to the core. I said, that's all right. Well, anyhow, Jesse calls, or he calls me up. He says, guess who sent me a picture? And mine's bigger than yours. <laughs> to this day, he thinks the Jewish show sent him that picture. I loved it. Uh, he's, he's a character. Well, Fred, I tell you what, it has been an absolute delight to visit with you today, and I sure hope that we can do this again because, uh, man, I know you've got so many stories to share, and uh, each one's better than the, the one before, but you truly are an inspiration to me and to many people out there who uh, perhaps are, uh, you know, at retirement age or whatever, and they're wondering what the future might hold for them as far as being able to enjoy something that they've enjoyed their entire lives. And hey, I, I, I done it all. I done it all. Well, I know I, that you have, and, I, and that's I why. I told my mother, if I live to be 50, I'll be tickled to death. I said, by then I've done it all. <laughs> well i tell you what my friend we're going to end this podcast uh, but we're definitely going to promise our, uh, to to call you again and, uh, and, Anytime. and get the get those stories together and good luck to you and your red bones and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll catch you uh, the next time around okay Stephen thanks for inviting me I appreciate it well, folks, that concludes our interview with the uh, immortal Fred Moran, the Redbone Man. What a guy, 85 years old, still coon hunting five or six nights a week. Still, my mind's still sharp, still got the stories to tell. And uh, you've just been um, privileged, whether you know it or not, to listen to the stories of Fred. Uh, we're going to end this podcast now, and, and we'll be back again next week. We want to thank our friends at DU Supply, DU Hunting Supply, uh, dot com. Anything you need in the line of hunting gear, uh, equipment, and especially in the electronic line, or you need uh, uh, you have issues with the with the uh, products, electronic products that you buy at DU Supply, you'll find they have the very best in customer service. I want to give a shout out to my good friend, Big Mark Zepp. Uh, Mark has come out with a new uh, hunting coat for or jacket for coon hunters and, and any outdoor person, the uh, familiar uh, nylon brown material, the kind uh, when he worked for so many years with uh, John Wick. Um, coon hunters will remember that. Uh, I just saw some a new line of products that he has, a new jacket that's flannel lined, makes it uh, lighter weight than the uh, the one that he came out with earlier. He also had a, a real nice duffel bag that I particularly enjoy. You just throw all your stuff in that that bag and uh, and head out to the hunt or the woods but at any rate folks if anyone asks you where's steve fielder you tell them with confidence he's gone to the dogs